You have probably heard before that we describe sound using a wave model. And if that's the case, then from our talk of interference, we might now want to speak about how sound waves would interact with each other. And I'm going to consider two different ways at this point. So imagine that we have two different sources for sound. And let's describe those just using a couple of speakers. So we'll have two different speakers from our sound system. And let's say you're standing over here somewhere. Now, let's say we have both speakers are producing the same sound, and we'll make it, you know, just like a simple note, some very simple basic sound. And we know that sound waves will be coming from one speaker to you, and the other speaker will be sending sound waves from there to you. The question then is, what will you hear if we assume that two things. Let's assume two things about these speakers. They both are going to have the same amplitude of sound, and we're not going to worry about the sound dropping with distance, even though that's something we should worry about. But for simplicity's sake, we'll just say they produce sound of the same amplitude, and those waves don't dissipate at all. And we'll say they're the same frequency. And also, let's assume both speakers are in phase, which basically means when speaker one up here begins a sound, it's producing the same wave that will look identical to the speaker being produced by this one. The thing is, though, if we have, say, the wave coming from speaker one up here, going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, etc., and from speaker two, if we have them in phase, it will also go up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, etc., etc., but it could be the case that when they arrive, that they're not in phase with each other. Why would that be? Well, given whatever distance there is from speaker one to that point, it will have gone through so many oscillations, it'll have gone through so many periods. And how much of a distance, how many periods it's gone through is going to depend strictly on what is that distance there. Let's call this distance one, and then this will be distance two. And basically, how many oscillations have we had? Well, that's going to depend on, then, the distance you have traveled compared to the wavelength, since every time it does one complete wavelength, it's gone through one oscillation. So this ratio will tell you, basically, how many times wave one has oscillated. And the same thing with D2. And the thing is, if one wave is oscillated more than the other, then when they arrive, it will look like they've come together out of phase with each other. And depending on how much out of phase they are, they could be completely destructive, maybe only somewhat destructive. And it's also possible that the number of wave times it's come through will make it so that it's constructive again. So how are we supposed to deal with all of this? What is ultimately going to matter to find out if these waves are in phase with each other is going to be what is the distance between those speakers. So whatever distance difference we have from this, each speaker to that point, which we'll call R, this is going to tell us if they are in phase with each other or if they're going to not be in phase with each other. Because we see here, if we took these two ratios and we subtracted them from each other, we could get a fair number of different values. But suppose we got an integer value, so 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. If that were the case, then there's, an even, there's some straight up uh, difference of complete oscillations. And if you have a complete oscillation meeting another complete oscillation while they're in phase again. So anytime this comes out to be an integer, then that's going to be constructive. So if we come to an integer and we use this strange symbol for integers in math, then that's constructive. And if we get some sort of half integer sort of thing, 
So if we get half, three halves, five halves, that's going to be destructive because then one wave will have completed a full oscillation and the other wave will come in completing half an oscillation and so you'll have crest meeting trough. And so that'll be destructive. So when you're trying to figure out if sound waves are going to interfere with each other, you need to know what is the dis difference in distances those waves had to travel. You might also need to add in whatever phase distance there was initially. If the two speakers say, if we started them out of phase with each other, then we'd have to include that as well. But fortunately, that would just be tacking on the phase difference initially. So it would basically be taking R here, dividing that by lambda to get how many uh, uh, wavelength differences there are, and then adding the phase constant onto that. So basically taking this ratio and adding whatever that phase constant was. Then that's going to tell you completely if you'll have constructive or destructive interference. Now, let's consider another case, again, with two speakers. But let's not have them putting out the same frequency sound. What if we have the two sources interfering with each other at some point over here? So we have sound waves coming from speaker 1, sound waves from speaker 2. But let's put them at different frequencies. So we'll have frequency from speaker 1 and frequency from speaker 2. How will these add up together? Well, all right, this one isn't so clear now, so let's actually step back and see what happens in the case of adding the equations together. So if we had y1, we know how we can describe that. And since we're going to look at a very particular point, and if we are modeling this as standing waves, if we look at just one particular point then, then at that point, we can describe the wave with the amplitude and cosine 2 pi frequency 1 times time. And so I'm using the frequency rather than the angular frequency to make that a little bit more clear. And again, this, the sine part, which describes the um, motion I'm taking out because, again, I'm making this a standing wave being produced. And so we're just setting point P at some arbitrary point. So that coat that sign part is just constant. And we could do the same thing then, of course, with the second equation. And we'll say they're the same amplitude again, make our math simple. So I have cosine of 2 pi frequency 2 times time. And now we want to add these two together. Now, adding these two together, I'm going to use some trig identities to get the result I want, but it's not going to look nearly as clean as any of our other examples. But the total waveform we're going to get is going to have this interesting little form where it's going to have two times amplitude, cosine, and I'm going to quickly fill it in now. This lovely equation, which we see that there's a couple different ways that the frequencies are summed. There's a term here whereas the, the frequencies just add together divided by 2 in a cosine function, and here the two frequencies subtracted from each other. Now we see that if, for example, the two frequencies are the same, if f1 and f2 are the same, this is just 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so this whole term here just becomes 1, and so it just becomes 2 times a cosine of f divided, 2f divided by 2, so it just becomes the waveform itself and they just add together normally. But if there is a phase, if there is some sort of frequency difference, this is going to add some interesting oscillatory form to it. So really what we want to look at is this part of the equation, telling us how things are going to really oscillate. And this difference in the frequencies is what's going to basically mean that sometimes the wave is going to be nice and strong and sometimes weak and it's going to come in and out of phase. And so the equation form, or if we're trying to draw it, it would look something a bit like this. So we try describing the time axis this way, y position, and the, 
the subtracting portion of the equation is going to basically set when we're going to have our maximum frequency amount. So we would have something that would look a bit like this to describe that maximum amount and maximum in both directions. And then the second portion, the part that we see the frequencies added, will just oscillate back and forth between that. And so we get these almost bubbles of frequency, getting large, small, large. And so we almost have like a frequency on top of a frequency. And it's the portion here that is the subtracting portion. This is describing what we would call the beat frequency how much it's going back and forth between this uh, sound that's being produced is actually getting louder and softer and back and forth like this. So we simply describe then beat frequency, which we'll call F sub B, is just the difference between those two frequencies. And this is actually quite important if you're going to, say, tune a piano, because one of the ways you're going to do the tuning process is you're going to grab a tuning fork. Let's say it's supposed to be set for um, the A note at 440 hertz. You hit that, and then you press the key on your piano. And if they are perfectly tuned, then you just hear the same sound from both sources, and it's nice and loud. But if one of them is a little bit different, you're going to get this beat. And so instead of getting um, a nice tone, it's going to be something more like that's if it's a little bit off. If it's way off, it'll be even faster. The, you can see from this equation, the bigger that frequency difference, the faster it's going to pulsate, since frequency is the inverse period, so less time between each pulse. So if the beat frequency is quite large, it can go and even faster and faster than I can mimic with my um, poor vocal abilities. And at a certain point, the frequency difference can be so large that you won't be able to pick up with it on your own ears. But, and of course, if we make the frequency difference very small, it'll be very hard to notice. And that's basically how you're trying to tune your piano to one note. But also, you're going to notice if you do have a piano tuner, they don't have 88 tuning forks. So what they do is they actually listen to the beat itself. They say, well, this note is supposed to have this beat frequency relative to this tuning fork, so I'm going to listen until I get, say, a beat frequency of 4 hertz. So instead of having 88 tuning forks, you're going to have maybe a dozen. Not quite sure. But by listening to that beat frequency and knowing what you're supposed to get for each note, you can then adjust that way. So that's the basics of beat frequency. And it has, of course, some correspondence to beat, as you know, in music, but Leading us to say, if you want to hear a song like this, you really need a better soundtrack. I'm sure Katy Perry has much better songs than that.